So thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me in this beautiful location at this uh, historic event of Women in Science. When Viviana invited me, I was like, Women in Science, I have to be there. Um, and so I'm very excited. I want to talk to you today about memory um, and what emotion does to memory. And I focused my research on studying humans. Um, but I'm going to start by just uh, showing you this piece of art, since we're talking about art tonight. Uh, and its relation to, um, to emotion. And this is a, an, an, a uh, painting by Salvador Dali in 1931 called The Persistence of Memory. And I like this, uh, this uh, rendition of what memory is, in part because it shows you that memory is not a picture. It's not a replication of what, what's in front of you. It's an interpretation. It's dynamic. Um, you know, how we approach things can change the nature of our memory. Um, and that we think this is universally true about memory, but one of the earliest studies looking at emotion and memory, the impact of emotion and memory, suggested something different. Um, it talked about the idea of flashbulb memories, and this was work by two scientists, Brown and Kulik, who were at Harvard University. And what they did was they were fascinated by people's memories of all these consequential things that happened in the 1960s. So one of the things being the assassination of the American president at the time, John F. Kennedy. And they said that you know, these types of memories for highly emotional events seem to differ somewhat from the memories we have for more mundane events. They said these consequential, arousing, surprising events resulted in these detailed, vivid, veridical memories as if the brain took a picture of the event with a flashbulb, and that's how they came up with the term flashbulb memory. And you know, if you read early science papers, sometimes they're, they're a little more interesting than, than older science papers. So they actually put their own flashbulb memories in the paper. This is the memory for Kulik, talking about he was seated in a sixth grade music class. He heard over the intercom the president was shot. Um, everyone looked at each other. The class started yelling. Uh, the music teacher tried to calm everyone down. Ten minutes later, they heard of the intercom. Kennedy had died. Uh, and then he, he went to the homeroom teacher and she was crying. So again, very vivid, very detailed, the kind of detail you wouldn't necessarily expect um, in a more memory for a more, more mundane event. Um, and for a long time, researchers thought this was exactly what happened with emotion. Uh, it was like you took a picture. Your memories were these veridical um, images of that motion. It, it was sort of printed in time in your brain. Um, but when people started to look a little bit more at the qualities of these memories, they found that it wasn't quite like that. Um, and so since 1977, several investigators, including myself, have looked at how these flashbulb memories may change over time. And the main thing we find is they differ, they differ in the confidence and the accuracy. So one study that we did, um, I was in New York City uh, at the time of 9-11, um, and so we organized uh, right within the attack, we brought in a consortium of memory researchers from around the country, the United States, and also some in Europe, and we got people to tell us their memories of how they heard about the attack. Two weeks after the attack, we then measured their memories a year later, three years later, and 10 years later. Uh, and what we found was, you know, we couldn't actually know what individuals actually experienced. All we could know is, did their memory change over time? Um, and so what we found is about 40 to 50% of the details uh, the, of the memories that people gave us were different after a year. Um, and there was one study where they looked at, they compared details of memories for the attack of 9-11 and a more mundane event, and they found that this inconsistency in details of memories was the same for memories for 9-11 uh, versus memories for more mundane events. How they differed is people were highly confident their flashbulb memories were right. So I, you know, I was in New York that day, I remember the towers falling, I could give you a long story about exactly what I was doing. I, I feel like my memory is 100% correct, but my science tells me it's not. So, how does emotion change memory? What does it do to create the dynamic nature of memory? We know these memories are different somehow, but how are they different? To get at this question, um, we look at the neuroscience of the interaction of emotion and memory. And I'm gonna highlight here the amygdala that Marta mentioned. The amygdala is a brain region that we know uh, responds to things in the environment that are salient or important. 
And what I've plotted here looks a little bit like sort of a map of the trains coming into Grand Central Station in New York City. Um, but what it is is the connectivity map of the amygdala. So the amygdala is sort of ideally situated in the brain to take information about the emotional salience of events and then modulate uh, other brain regions to prioritize um, processing of information that might be important, things that evoke an emotional response in you. And so when we think about the role of the brain in how emotion changes memory, we have to remember memory is not sort of a one-shot thing. Memory is a process. Um, and so we take information in. We call that encoding. Um, we then store that information. We retain that information for a period of time. And then at a later time, you retrieve that information. So I want to look at each stage of memory and talk about what we know about how emotion might change processing at that stage. So we start with encoding. Uh, and here I want to start by talking about the amygdala's interaction with brain regions that process sensory information. So the amygdala has reciprocal connections with early visual cortical areas and other sensory areas as well. Um, and if you showed somebody an emotional face, for instance, or a neutral face, um, you'd see more activity in early visual regions um, for the emotional face, unless you had damage to the amygdala, in which case you would not. So this suggests this pathway where the amygdala gets information about the emotional salience of an, of an event very early on, and then perhaps modulates uh, visual processing from that point. So what types of things does the early visual cortex do? So here's my class participation part of the lecture. Um, the lines here are tilting right or left. Someone just yell it out. Thank you. How about this one? So what's different between these two? It, must have been a, it should have been a little harder for you to say right than left. Uh, and what I vary here is contrast. Contrast is a very early visual feature. It's necessary to detect things like edges and lines, the kinds of things that come together to form our perceptions of objects and events. Uh, and this is one of the things the early visual cortex does. And what we did was we flashed people faces uh, prior to trying to detect contrast, the orientation of lines. And if I flash you with a face like this, you might need about this much contrast to tell me the orientation. But if I flash a face like this that says there's something fearful out there, you need less contrast to be able to tell me the orientation. So this suggests to us that one of the things emotion does very early on in processing stimuli is it aids attention and perception uh, that can lead to enhanced perception of some details. You really just see them better. But uh, emotion also has another consequence on, on perception and attention. Um, this is a region called the parietal cortex. The parietal cortex is important for shifting emotion, for moving, looking at one thing and then deciding to attend to something else. So you can look to the left, but if, I wanna, if something important is going on over here, I want to then look to the right. Um, and the parietal cortex enables you to move your attention around voluntarily. What happens when you see something like this? So imagine you're driving down the highway and there's a car accident. Now, it could even be on the other side of the road. There's no blockage on your side of the road. But what people tend to do is when the car accident's there, they slow down. They slow down, they stare at the car accident, now there's a traffic jam behind you, even though there's no blockage in the road. Um, and this is because emotion captures our attention. When something is emotional is, is uh, flashed, what happens is this region of the brain that is necessary to focus your attention on what you should be doing, which is driving, shows less activity. It makes it harder to attend to other, you know, other events in the environment. So emotion also captures attention, and this results in impaired perception of the other details that are out there. So I'll go back to my example of 9-11. Imagine you're there that day. You see the tower um, on fire. You might perceive some of these details, these central details, very well, even better than something that's not emotional. But you're likely to miss other details that you might be looking at if it wasn't a highly emotional event. Okay, I want to move on to the second pay stage of memory, which is retention. We tend to think of retention as a sort of passive uh, period of time where nothing's going on, but actually, in your brain, a lot is happening. There are synaptic changes that are occurring over time that create that memory, that, that, that is the formation of that memory. We call this process 
consolidation. And as Marta mentioned, the hippocampus is the brain region that's most involved in our memories. Um, if, if you have damage to this region, you have poor memory. It's one of the regions that's, that's, uh, that's influenced, um, that's, that's damaged early in Alzheimer's disease, which is why one of the first symptoms is poor memory. But what happens when something's emotional? Um, you often will, it, it often will evoke an arousal response. Much like freezing, you have changes in heart rate, things like that, uh, and the release of stress hormones. And there's been, a, a, there's been a, a, a lot of work in rodents and some in humans showing that when there is an arousal response, when stress hormones are released, the amygdala modulates the hippocampus to enhance the storage or consolidation of the emotional events. So what does this look like um, if you're looking at emotional information? So imagine I showed you uh, a picture like this, a nice little picnic in the park, or a picture like this, a car, um, a, a airplane crash. Uh, and then later on, I said, do you, I, but I, I said to you, do you remember seeing these pictures before? I showed you some that you saw before, some that you did not. And what you'll see is, you know, immediately, you're going to remember almost all of those pictures. Uh, me visual memory is very good. If I wait 24 hours, we're going to see for the more neutral pictures, the more mundane events, what is sort of the most reliable effect in memory is that memory decays over time. But for the highly emotional scenes, what we see is memory uh, persists. You don't see the same rate of forgetting. So emotion and arousal in particular enhances the retention, the consolidation of emotional events. So to go back to our, um, to our example, so now I've experienced an event like this. Um, I have taken in, excuse me, I have perceived some of these central details perhaps better than I would if it wasn't emotional, missed other details, but those few details that I encoded, the few details that came in, I've now laid those memories down very strongly. I've retained those memories over time. So I now want to get to the last stage um, of memory, which is retrieval. So now I'm going to bring that information up, and I'm going to try to remember it. So one of the things about retrieval, when you come up with your memories, when you think about, you know, I know that or I don't know that, it's not an all or none process. There are qualities to our memories, qualities to our retrieval. We have, a, we have a subjective sense of remembering. So for instance, you know, you could be confident that your memory is accurate, or maybe not so confident it's accurate. Maybe I should get more information. You could, it, the memory could be, seem vivid. You could feel like you're reliving as you're coming up with the memory or it may not seem so vivid. It could have a lot of details along with it. So you remember this one thing happened, but then you remember all the other things that happened around it, or not a lot of details. And sometimes, we sort of know that we know something, it's familiar, but we don't even know where we know it from, right? So there's all these subjective qualities that come with our memories. And as we know from the work on flashbulb memories, that emotion enhances this subjective sense of remembering. We feel like these memories are more vivid. We feel, feel like we're more confident that they're right. Um, but when we think about this, you know, how do we, why would that be the case? What is happening in the brain that's different for emotional events that leads to this enhanced subjective sense of remembering um, that, is, that, when, you know, when, 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 that we don't see so much for neutral events? So one question we want to ask is, what brain systems support the subjective sense of remembering for emotional and neutral events? So again, we presented uh, participants pictures like this of sort of mundane events, pictures like this of highly emotional events. And we asked, do you, about 24 hours later, do you remember seeing this scene before? And if so, do you recollect it with a lot of detail and vividness or confidence, or does it just seem familiar to you? And then we can say, what, what, what regions of the brain support this judgment of remembering something with vividness and confidence uh, versus just seeming familiar. So I want to now introduce another brain region called the parahippocampus. It's right below the hippocampus. It's involved in memory as well. Um, and it's particularly involved in memory for seen details. Uh, this is actually called the parahippocampal place area. You can even imagine places that have details, and we'll see activity in this region. And it's this region that when we compare neutral pictures that you say 
you remember really well a lot of details versus ones that you do not, it's this region where we see more activity. So it seems in this case, at least what the brain is telling us, is that having a lot of these details gives you that feeling of vividness and confidence for these neutral pictures. What about for emotional pictures? For emotional pictures, the region that differentiates those that you recall with a lot of confidence and vividness from those that you just seem familiar to you is the amygdala. So as I've already told you, the amygdala is necessary uh, for enhancing the perception of some details of the memory. It also is important in laying down those, uh, the details of the mem memories more strongly. And it's this region that seems to um, respond to, that seems to be underlying uh, that feeling of vividness, that feeling of confidence for these highly emotional events. So even though you're making the exact same memory judgment, do I, do, do, does this memory have a lot of vividness with it? Is it am I confident? Is this accurate? You're making the exact same memory judgment. Different brain regions seem to underlie this subjective sense of remem remembering, depending on whether it's an emotional event or a neutral event. We also, um, just to sort of confirm that this was happening in sort of real life emotional events, we did a, a study where we looked at people recalling uh, the 9-11 attacks versus recalling uh, another mundane event that happened around the same time, and we saw essentially the same thing. As confidence in your memories from the 9-11 attack went up relative to other memories, so did your activity in the amygdala, and then, your con and then uh, we saw a decrease in activity in the parahippocampus. So just to go back to my, uh, my event, so initially I am perceiving aspects of this event better and missing other contextual details. Those details that I encode get laid down more strongly. So now I have some very strong details, very strong memories for a few details, and that's underlying this enhanced sense of vividness and confidence, even for details that weren't uh, initially encoded correctly. So this is just what I've told you. Emotion enhances encoding of some details, but impairs encoding of other details. Details that are, are encoded are likely retained due to the impact of arousal and consolidation. And the strong, vivid memories for a few details underlie the enhanced subjective sense of remembering and confidence in accuracy for emotional events. But that's not the end of the story. So, you know, I gave you sort of a, a timeline of three things that happen. You encode something. You retain it. You retrieve it. But we all know we retrieve memories multiple times. Um, especially things for emotional events. They come up in our minds, you know, they pop up, we can't stop thinking about them sometimes. Um, and so what happens later? Well, when we retrieve memories again, they can change. So about 20 years after the first, um, the persistence of memory, uh, 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 the persistence of memory was created, Dolly cr created a second piece called the disintegration of the persistence of memory. Um, and in this, you know, he talks, he, he has little, Pit, uh, little, little pieces of information that seem to break apart. We all know that memories change over time, that you know, we forget things over time, but they also can be recombined, they can be changed uh, as, as we retrieve things over and over. And the way this works in the brain um, is a process called reconsolidation. So the, I'm going to introduce you recon to reconsolidation by first talking about how we used to think memories work. Um, the traditional view of memories was that we have an emotional event, we have an event, there's, the, uh, there's consolidation, the synaptic changes occur that become that memory. I could disrupt consolidation by giving you a drug and you would never form the memory. Um, but, but initially it was thought, once a memory is stored, it's there in your brain. When you retrieve that memory, you take it out like it's a file coming out of a file drawer, then you put it back, and then you take it out again the next time you retrieve it. About two decades ago, there was a reinvigoration of an alternative view of memory. And this, this view is called the reconsolidation view. And so this suggests that when you learn something, you have an initial consolidation period, the memory gets stored in your mind. When you retrieve that memory, however, it has to undergo, um, some of the time, it undergoes an additional consolidation period. Uh, this additional consolidation period now is another opportunity to change that memory. So if you think about why would we have this multiple multiple um, consolidations of an event, there's really two hypothesized reasons for this. One, it strengthens the memory. By having multiple consolidations, you can make the memory stronger. You might retrieve emotional memories more, 
and reconsolidate them more, making the memory somewhat stronger, but also it provides an opportunity to change the memory. Information at the time of retrieval may be relevant for that future use of the memory, and so now that information can get integrated into the original memory. So this un can underlie the dynamic nature of memory. Now, I will say, I'm sort of taking you to the limit of the science. We don't really know exactly how emotion changes the reconsolidation of memories as they're recollected multiple times over, over our lifespan, but we do know that emotion can influence many of the processes that are involved in reconsolidation, so it likely has a strong effect, and these memories may be evolving uh, even as we age. And with that, I want to thank the people that um, did the work and inspired the work, and all of you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the interesting talk. So we received, uh, again, many questions from the online system. Yes. So also, think about if you have some question, you just raise your hand. And we can start from a question from Razan. Thank you, Liz. There's a question about your study, about the memories after 9-11. Yes. And the question goes, if you differentiated between people with post-traumatic um, disorder, and if so, did those people remember better or less yes. the, so, the event? So we did not, um, we actually excluded individuals who developed post-traumatic disorder um, from 9-11 in our study. Having said that, we know quite a bit about um, post-traumatic stress disorder and its influence on memory. And what we find, you know, you know obviously post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder where you, know, you, you sort of uh, reflexively, these memories come up over and over again, continually to create stress uh, in the individual, and you can't seem to control it. Um, but there's no evidence that those memories are um, stronger or more accurate. Um, in fact, you know, these memories tend to be rather generalized at times, right? And so we know that post-traumatic stress disorder, at least in the long term, actually can impair memory. All the stress hormones that are involved can impair memory function. So it's not the case that, you know, if you have a memory where you develop post-traumatic stress disorder, it actually is more accurate than, a than somebody who did not. In fact, it could be even slightly less accurate. Yes, we have a, a question in the audience. Yeah, microphone is arriving. Thanks, Liz. Uh, really nice talk. Um, I have a very high-level question, sure. and that is, do you view this kind of rewriting of memories as a feature or a bug? Is this something that serves some purpose, yes. or is it, is it a kind of failure of our memory I think systems. it's a feature. Um, I think, you know, memory, memory was not made for the courtroom, right? You know, there's a lot of work on law and neuroscience and, you know, how we want memory to be accurate, but that's not the function of memory. Your memory is to guide your future actions, right? To be able to use your past to guide your future actions. It should be the case that information that's available at the time of retrieval can, can, inco can be incorporated into your memory because that's relevant to the function of the memory, which is to guide your future actions. You know, the downside is, you know, it may not be as accurate a representation of the initial event. Um, and so in the courtroom, that's a bad thing. But that's not the function of memory, unless you're a lawyer. So. 